Welcome. My name is Don Emerson. I run the Southeast Asia program in the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University. Our webinar today uses evidence from Southeast Asia to ask an important but rarely posed question. Can democracy handle ethnic war? Question mark. Our featured speaker, Professor Jacques Bertrand, is well equipped to answer that question, for he has written or co-written two very recent books about it. The most recent, just published in July of this year, is Winning by Process, The State and Neutralization of Ethnic Minorities in Myanmar, written by Professor Bertrand with two co-authors, a former student of mine, Ardette Mong, who has had a productive career as a professor of political science in the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, and Alexander Pelletier, an assistant professor of political science at Université Laval in Quebec City, Canada, who has received several awards for his performance and dissertation at the University of Toronto. The second book, written by Professor Bertrand alone, is Democracy and Nationalism in Southeast Asia, From Secessionist Mobilization to Conflict Resolution, published last year. Professor Bertrand is our current Li Kongqian NUS Stanford Fellow on Contemporary Southeast Asia and a professor of political science at the University of Toronto, where he founded and headed the Center for Southeast Asian Studies in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He has worked and published for many years on issues of ethnic conflict, nationalism, and secessionism in Southeast Asia. That combination of scholarship and experience, including extensive field research, makes him unusually well suited to address the topic of democracy and ethnic war. Our discussant today is the current Oxenberg Rowling Fellow in Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, Ambassador Scott Marcial. He has had many diplomatic assignments in or relevant to Southeast Asia, both in Washington, DC and in the region including most recently as the U.S. Ambassador to Myanmar from 2016 to 2020. Professor Bertrand will start us off by addressing the webinar question, can democracy handle ethnic war? Ambassador Marcial will then comment, and we may have an interchange among the three of us briefly before opening the session to Q&A. Jacques, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Don, for this very generous introduction and I'm really delighted to be here to be able to um, present some of my work and to have a lively discussion with both of you and uh, everybody who uh, are kindly participating today. I'm looking forward to our discussion. So the, the topic today is, can democracy handle ethnic war? And uh, as already been uh, advertised, uh, I am drawing by drawing from two recent books, The Winning by Process that was mentioned on Myanmar and Democracy and Nationalism in Southeast Asia. What I want to do is not to present the, the two books. I wouldn't want to be doing this in one talk, but is really to draw on some of the ideas that come out of these two books that kind of are themes that come cut across the two, uh, the, the two works. So the main questions and issues of interest uh, that I've been really thinking about uh, in, for this talk and, and broadly in these, uh, in these pieces of work are, you know, Southeast Asia has seen lots of civil wars, uh, most of which involve secessionist or ethnic grievances. The level of violence and mobilization has varied. The question then becomes, when there have been periods of democracy, has democracy helped or has it hindered? It's not a surprise to anybody who looks at the globe who looks at Asia uh, and is interested in secessionist conflict, that it's not a Southeast Asia specific problem. Uh, just looking at some of the examples across Asia, we have uh, the Uyghurs very much in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the news these days, Tibetans, Kashmiri, many others, but there's a large concentration of these conflicts that have occurred in Southeast Asia and that have drawn uh, the attention of, uh, throughout my career of the work that I've done. Now, these, of course, occur in democratic and authoritarian settings. But for this presentation, I want to focus on a subset of these, in part, uh, speak very briefly about Myanmar's numerous conflicts. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these conflicts, but try to draw a bit the context in which uh, these conflicts were, 
we're evolving in the last 15 years. Indonesia, I want to focus briefly on Aceh and Papua by comparison and look at the Philippines in terms of Mindanao and uh, the Moros in the south of the Philippines. So to start the, the reflection that, I, uh, that has informed some of this work is to start with these broad debates that political science has had in the relation to, to violent conflict for more than two, three decades, in fact. And the first question is, should democracy help? Uh, that's been one of the big questions, right? And what we know is that this, this debate, even though it's been going on for many decades, is inconclusive. Democracy sometimes increases violence. There's been a big argument out there saying that it oftentimes foments opportunistic nationalist mobilization, that when institutions are transitioning to democracy, that gives moments in which you see groups mobilize and sometimes mobilize violently. In other contexts, however, and there are many, many arguments, I'm not going through all of these, but many arguments where we think democracy should reduce violence. In my work, uh, I stress the following uh, kind of, of, of reasons. One is that it would increase channels for mobilization. Violence is just becomes one of many other ways that one can express uh, grievances. A second is that it dilutes claim to national group representation. So groups that use violence who claim to represent a group uh, no longer are the only ones who claim to represent political parties emerge, civil society organizations, other representatives from the same groups that have these grievances. A third is that uh, the cost of violence increases over time, both for the state and for these groups under democratic governance. And so there are reasons why we should expect that democracy might also reduce violence, but it all doesn't always. You really see a little bit uh, of both uh, situations. Now, the question is, in the three cases or the three countries that I'm focusing on today, did it uh, have a make a difference? Well, in Indonesia, it's interesting is you, you get the best of all these cases is Aceh, where the conflict appears in some ways to have gone away. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the point is that it is the, probably the case in which under democratic government, we now see that Aceh's violent conflict has mostly disappeared and you seem to have regularized governance in the province of Aceh. However, even in this fabulously, the best case of, 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 the, of the, uh, the region, in Indonesia, we also have uh, Papua, where uh, recently certainly uh, things have continued to worsen rather than get better under the same democratic government. So one needs to ask ourselves why. Uh, secondly, in the Philippines, there is another perhaps good news story that has emerged in the last three years uh, with the passage of a Bangsamoro basic law, which seems to be the beginning of a, a law that will uh, possibly uh, lead to a longstanding peace uh, in, in the South of the Philippines. But this is after decades under democratic rule of many, many iterations that failed and that uh, had uh, difficulty uh, leading to a breakthrough. So uh, one, ask ourselves why as well. And in Myanmar, well, a little less advanced in terms of the kinds of, of uh, context of democracy that, that we might have had by comparison, in Myanmar, we have 10 years of an attempt at semi-democratic government uh, that, uh, of course, ended with uh, the coup last year, but where you had a decade of talks, some, a national, nationwide ceasefire agreement that not all groups adhered to, but a significant number of them did, a political dialogue that was put into place, but at the same time, in parallel to this, lots of continued civil war. So that leads to ask the question then, what, in, in what ways does democracy uh, affect these conflicts? It creates two conundrums when we think about you know, what, what role would democracy play in, in these kinds of conflicts. One is, if the objective is to reduce violence, well, what works? That's the first kind of question. A lot of people ponder uh, over this question uh, in, in this field. Well, repression and authoritarianism sometimes does reduce violence, doesn't make the conflicts go away. It makes violence disappear through repression and authoritarian means, but, uh, but uh, I would contend it rarely solves uh, any problem of these problems, they don't go away. But democracy can uh, reduce violence, but when and how? And, and that's an important uh, question. The second uh, conundrum here, more democracy, if we uh, are trying to promote or a country wants more <laughs> democracy, 
it obviously leads to more freedoms, accountability, political participation, and a lot of enthusiasms toward the democratic uh, regime. We saw it in Myanmar, we've seen it in Indonesia for the last few decades. But then the question becomes, well, what if it fails to resolve deep grievances and leads to more conflict in these cases, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm talking about these secessionist groups or minority groups that are making some claims. So it's, it's at this juncture that I'm, uh, my work is focused on. And I want to focus specifically here on two analytical foci. The first is to think about democracy and process a little more. And that in many ways, when you think about the role that democracy plays in many, uh, in, in, in that to set a context where these conflicts occur, there's oftentimes too much emphasis on institutional structures and it misses some important dimensions that go beyond these structures. And one of the emphases that I, I have uh, in this work uh, is to think about the process. The process by which uh, I mean negotiation forums and democracy in practice. Uh, what happens once you have the laws in place, the constitution in place in terms of having these implemented or even when you have peace agreements, how do these become implemented in such a way that actually uh, help to, to reduce grievances? And I think there's a bit of reflection that should go uh, more into the, those dimensions. The second is uh, democracy beyond and below formal structures. And now I, I could be talking about many different aspects of this, but I wanna focus on one in particular, and that's the question of autonomy, because it often comes up in, in all these, these uh, nationalist or secessionist conflicts as an important dimension. Autonomy is often seen, in my view, as a, as a panacea. It will resolve the conflict uh, if you obtain it. So bringing you to this one book where we, uh, along with my co-authors, uh, we thought about winning by process. Uh, I want to just very, very briefly introduce you what we mean by that and, and what was the focus of process that I think where, uh, is interesting to look at in that decade. So on the eve of the February 2021 coup, uh, the state we would argue was winning by process. And that's by contrast then by winning by war, which it's been trying to do since, uh, since uh, independence or by agreement, which it hadn't uh, been able to achieve. The decade of semi-democratic rule that while appearing to provide new forms to negotiate peace, ended up allowing the state to increasingly neutralize ethnic armed groups through process. So our argument is that although we don't think it was quite deliberate and strategic as it sounds, there was some of this happening through process, that the state was actually reaching its goals through this decade of manipulation, manipulating the, uh, the process. What do we mean by winning? Well, it was maximizing political stability, minimizing the use of force, minimizing political concessions, and reaching its goals. Basically, the goals it had been trying to reach uh, to, to win uh, by war for the previous decades. By process here, what we emphasize in this book is that there were a lot of things going on in that decade in Myanmar, but I want to focus on a few things here. One is what is not only the negotiation forum where uh, ethnic armed groups were also were negotiating with the state. It's also the fact that prior to opening up, there's a new constitution put into place, 2008 constitution, that the former military rulers had put into place and that provided the framework for the decade of semi-democratic rule. The process of implementing this 2008 constitution became in a sense, a part of this negotiation forum where new representatives, new people in, in institutions at the state level, all these institutions were being created, were given more representation to ethnic minority groups. They became part of this process of then uh, negotiating more power for those states through the, the constitution of 2008 while there were negotiations going on in uh, the formal ceasefire and political dialogue forums. So they were created, but all these rules, negotiations, and processes, we argue, were creating new constraints and new incentives uh, towards state goals. So very briefly, reminding that the democratic uh, framework, in, you know, the starting point uh, in, in our minds was that it, it did change something. It did, it did matter. It's not to say that it was not credible. In fact, what it did was to create a framework where credible negotiations could occur. When we look at the timeline that I have here, in 1989, uh, where you had a series of ceasefires, were not credible. Uh, they were ceasefires that were there mainly to allow 
uh, the state to reorganize itself. Same for uh, armed groups. They were satisfied they could get a break from the war and they could reorganize. Uh, but, but essentially, there was very little credibility after 1989 in terms of the negotiations that were attempted uh, and, and, the, and any kind of dialogue under authoritarian, uh, under authoritarian rule. But 2011, and then followed by 2015 with Aung San Suu Kyi's government, one can make the, should make the claim that there was a real opportunity here. There was a moment where both sides really thought that something could come out of this, and there was some credibility because of this democratic moment. Uh, so I'm not saying this was a sham from the outset. What I, I'm arguing is that it was credible that the negotiations could have delivered something, but there was you know, power inequality in terms of controlling uh, some of the process. What's the consequence? While war continued uh, as a strategy, the ceasefire negotiations and political dialogue added a new arena. So there was war happening in some areas. Uh, the... Uh, Negotiations, political dialogue were occurring uh, formally. And then during the implementation of the 2008 constitutions, you had a multiplication of actors that were uh, gaining more representation. So suddenly ethnic armed groups find themselves losing a monopoly of representation. This mattered. It was important. Political parties, civil society organizations in uh, ethnic minority states were gaining credibly more representation, or at least more voice, and were making claims to be uh, to not speak, uh, own to, do not have ethnic armed groups speak uh, for them. They wanted their own voice. And there was a process that allowed them to do so within the political dialogue, for instance. Uh, and ethnic minorities joined in local state governments, parliaments, even central state institutions. So there's no denying that there was a, a, a broadening of, of representation occurring uh, during this period. Yet the conflict appeared stalled. <clears throat> Negotiations led to a nationwide ceasefire in 2015 uh, and subsequent political dialogue, but few gains were achieved. I think most people agree after the fact that, of course, much of the, the, uh, the agreements that were reached during the political dialogue really amounted to very vague principles, not many that had to do with the most important points to uh, ethnic uh, minorities. Uh, and essentially were a, a large disappointment for those who did believe that they could actually deliver. In the war arena, of course, some groups sought more leverage, uh, while the Tatmadaw sought to reduce fronts to confront, confront those that were left. That is something, of course, that they uh, had been doing prior to 2011 as well. So how did this uh, proceed as uh, just wrapping up in, in some extent this, this part of, of my presentation is to say that well, in the, the dialogue, the rules that were put into place, actually that proposed by ethnic minority groups, interestingly enough, became their own set of constraints towards reaching uh, agreement. So they had more representation, more groups were represented, but because the representation was diluted, because of the rules that were put into place, the military mm -hmm. representatives and state representatives were able to actually control much of the process, control much of the discussions, and prevent the evolution of the dialogue from going further, which made a lot of representatives quite frustrated. That's in the formal sense. In the state governments and in the way in which the uh, constitution was implemented, it becomes clear that there were a lot of the so-called gains that were made by state governments, and it gets very detailed very, very quickly, there were a lot of powers that were uh, given to state governments that could easily be under, undermined by the central state. And in fact, when we look at the enthusiasm that was put into place in parliaments and the role of parliamentarians and state governments, uh, at all levels, the central government continued to hold uh, a whole lot of control. And this was in the laws that were put into place, regulations and so forth. Same thing for recognition of smaller ethnic groups. We go in the book to uh, what is an interesting consequence of the 2008 constitution is that, and this shows a little bit, this, this was more intentional, was that the constitution gave more opportunities for groups to voice and to, and to make claims to ethnic representation, which contributed to then undermining the, uh, the representation of the larger ethnic groups that were trying to create and, and solidify ethnic states and, and contributed to, there were rules that contributed to uh, mobilization to create smaller and smaller zones of recognition for ethnic minorities.
which of course played him right into the state's objectives at this point. So this is a bit what we do in the book to sort of emphasize the importance of paying attention to process to see what are the results. So democracy helped in many ways to create a more credible environment for negotiation, better representation. And I think we can't take that away from those 10 years, but it did enable the state to manipulate, undermine, and neutralize. Shifting slightly from the Myanmar case, but keeping it in mind, in Myanmar, many of the ethnic armed groups, for instance, uh, and I will come back to this uh, just at the end of, of, uh, of the presentation, but a lot of the uh, ethnic armed groups, if asked what it is that they would like the most, they would like federalism. And they uh, celebrate the recognition now of the principle of federal democracy. Federalism uh, is one form of autonomy. Uh, most groups that are secessionist, nationalists ask for a kind of for autonomy. Uh, my question becomes, is autonomy in a sense a panacea, right? Where you sort of see autonomy as the sort of goal, but what does autonomy actually mean uh, concretely? So most nationalist uh, groups, secessionist groups seek, seek autonomy. Uh, we've seen this in Myanmar, as I was just mentioning, and Indonesia, Philippines, these are worthy objectives as well. Papuans, Achenese, Moros, all sought autonomy, short of obtaining independence, which they realistically all knew they wouldn't obtain, they would want the highest degree of, of autonomy. But there's no easy template, there's no easy end goal, and there's definitely no obvious institutional form that can be easily implemented from one place to the next. So that's one level in which it becomes important important to, to think about the formal structures of autonomy itself. Let's think about Indonesia for a moment. After 1988, uh, Indonesia democratized and has been a democratic regime uh, since then, but there was uh, a dramatic rise in secessionist conflict in Aceh uh, followed. Uh, so in fact, there's, if it, the book, my, my other book goes into uh, some reasons why the moment of democratization led to more violence rather than less. As I was saying at the opening, it's not always obvious uh, that democracy reduces uh, violence. In some cases, it does fuel it. And it did in the case of Aceh. It did. The worst of the civil war probably occurred in the first few years of the democratic regime. But what the, when, when we look at the trajectory, uh, it did lead to the 2006 peace agreement, uh, the law, or 2005 peace agreement, a law led to the law of Aceh of 2006, and which has been peaceful since. So there's something interesting here that this law on Aceh, of course, gives a large amount of autonomy to, uh, to Aceh and is a successful case uh, of autonomy. But is it only because of the substance of autonomy? That's one of the questions. In Papua, you had some, the rise after democratization of protest, initially recurrent violence at a much lower scale though, uh, but uh, the violence has continued. There's been no good solution to, uh, to, to Papua. There, the grievances have remained. And, uh, and what you've seen is a worsening of violence and repression in recent years. So, but in both cases, the democratic state implemented autonomy with a high degree of fiscal and administrative power, both to Aceh and to Papua, which then have become West Papua and Papua provinces, two separate provinces. So interestingly, and I don't want to get into the details of the, of the two laws at the moment, but interestingly, when we look at both of these, the Aceh, the law on Aceh, and the law on uh, the West Papua on special autonomy in 2002, if we just take those as sort of templates for autonomy, what's interesting is that in and of themselves, they're both very generous in terms of the new institutions they create to represent both Achenese and Papuans, the power that they recognize at the provincial level, the fiscal allocations they provide to, 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 the, to, to the provinces. Uh, so in many ways, they're comparable and they're very, and they're very similar. So why is you know, 2006 worked so well uh, and yet the special autonomy bill in 2002 did not? So I'll come back to that in a moment. We have the Philippines, again, a question, uh, uh, a, uh, a situation in which you had a very long standing civil war, uh, the Moros against uh, the Philippine state. And yet, this is in the longest democracy in South Southeast Asia. We could say that, except for the Marcos regime, it has been democratic, maybe generally low quality. <coughs> we all recognize that it's been a low quality democracy, but recognized at least as an electoral democracy, and certainly some deterioration under Duterte. Under 
strata, and, and so it has varied by one administration to the next. And, and, uh, but in comparative terms, we could certainly agree, I think, that it's uh, somewhat uh, has been democratic to some extent. Now, there were two important agreements. In 1996, there was an agreement with the Moral National Liberation Front. And, and uh, I, my conclusion is that that agreement failed. Uh, but I'll come back to what happened with the 1996 agreement in a moment. And by contrast, though, in 2018, we get the Bangsa Mora Law, uh, which is the agreement with the MILF, the Moral Islamic Liberation Front, after two decades of difficult negotiations and setbacks, probably more than two decades. So in both cases, democracy did have some positive, again, setting an environment in which these conflicts should have had a better, uh, better outcomes. Uh, they reduced the ability of states to sustain repressive policies. We see the mechanisms occur in both cases in Indonesia, Philippines. Some, in many instances, there were a lot of pressures electorally to, uh, to reduce a violence when violence peaked, particularly in Aceh. It made more difficult justification for groups to mobilize violently over, over the long term. The groups themselves as well in a democratic context could not use violence so easily and, and justify it to their population, uh, to their, their constituents. <clears throat> Created more credible environments for representation uh, in all cases. And it did open up opportunities for negotiations or state concessions. In all these cases, uh, democratic governance did help to create those forums for more credible forms for negotiation and state concessions. Now, there are a lot of factors that can explain why it, the trajectory is that you would get, in some instances, violent outcomes. Uh, and, and the two books go into a fair amount. I'm not going to focus on that. I just want to name a couple just to say that I, I don't ignore all of these other factors that are, that are important to understand some of these processes. Some of them have to do with electoral coalitions. Some have to do with structures of representative and governance institutions. Some have to do with degrees of centralization, decentralization, and there are more. But what I want to sort of stress though as a, as a set of parameters is that autonomy as a goal or as an instrument is not an easy, easy to adopt as a template. So it means that there, there are other uh, contextual factors that determine why there are certain fiscal allocations, certain kinds of powers, certain kinds of institutions that are created that become, uh, that, that help to reduce uh, these grievances. And it has a lot to do with the credibility of the commitment that's key. Uh, now that's an argument that's been made many times, but democracy does increase credibility uh, of the commitment on the part of the state. Uh, and it certainly increases for those who are interested in these issues, when there are third party negotiators, third parties that mediate, that certainly does help as well. So, but there are some legal mechanisms that become important. Constitutionalization of autonomy is an important aspect. Legislation that creates and recognizes territorial autonomy is also important for certain groups and that increases credibility for sure. But the process by which this is adopted is very important. And, and I'll get to the example soon. If, if all parties are not invested in the process, it undermines the credibility of the law that's put into place. The post-legislative process is also important. Peace agreements and autonomy laws are only the beginning. Uh, the devil is in the detail. As a, a couple of my interviewees uh, in, in, in the Philippines in particular mentioned, and it has a lot to do with what comes next after autonomy laws, and that could make a big difference. So if we compare and contrast Indonesia's law on Aceh with the Philippines, for instance. Well, Indonesia's law on Aceh, the constitutional provisions supported autonomy, but the law was negotiated uh, by GAM and the central government, GAM, the, uh, the Achenese, Gakan uh, the uh, <clears throat> Free Aceh movement. And it was supported by political conventions that made possible the adoption of an agreement in parliament with very few changes in place. Contrast this with the Philippines, where the constitutional provision supporting autonomy is actually much stronger and was specific in terms of Muslim Mindanao. But there have been repeated failures of autonomy laws uh, with the MNLF. This 1996 agreement I mentioned, it uh, goes through several iterations of the laws that are go through parliament to try to put into place the peace agreement. But every autonomy law that came through ended up basically diluting completely the agreement that had been signed and by the time it, it, it even came time for a vote, 
uh, the Philippines was passed, was going back into an election or a you know, presidential term was ending and they would start once again in the next uh, presidential term. And so these kinds of processes where Sure, it's a democratic process that works, but it contributes to repeatedly undermining the agreements that have been reached with a group such as the MNLF. Add to this things such as referenda in order to determine whether the, the public agreed to the agreements that were reached through uh, the, the, the laws that are put into place, which of course means then uh, what are the who, who has a right to vote in this referenda will determine the outcomes and if the minority remains a minority in the referenda, there are very few chances that they will win uh, the referendum. There are other examples I can get into uh, in terms of, and I do get into in terms of how the Philippines has been uh, a very difficult democratic context to be able to implement these uh, kinds of agreements. I'll just say perhaps what is the big difference in the Bangsamoro law uh, is that in, in this case, you had a very particular president who, uh, despite all the criticism that one might have against Duterte, was somebody from Mindanao who happened to be president at a time when the violence really became uh, quite shocking to the country. Uh, it was no longer seen as limited to Mindanao, but the Marawi crisis uh, was, was seen as something quite, quite dramatic, but that was not in itself what was made a big difference. Duterte had the power to had uh, a, an unusual uh, control of Congress that allowed him to convince people to, uh, to, <clears throat> just to uh, pass the law before his term was going to end, whereas it was a limitation in other administrations. <clears throat> so when we look at Myanmar, uh, when we think about principles of federal democracy, uh, I think that's a good beginning. It's a nice principle. Uh, it's interesting to, to, as an objective, but the lesson from Indonesia and the Philippines is that beyond reaching autonomy or even an agreement on autonomy or principles of federalism, a lot has to do with what comes after legislation that would be quite detailed uh, and, and, and specific in terms of what it, would, uh, what it would entail. So key points. Democracy, I think, is very helpful to create a credibility, uh, credibility and set a terrain for some negotiated agreements. Uh, for potential representation, for framework to work through grievances. Uh, and I think it's, all, it, it's helpful in that way. But it, why does it uh, diverge in terms of outcomes? There's still result, unresolved debates as to about its merits overall to resolve secessionist and nationalist conflicts. And we do need more attention to things such as process, which I was indicating, how the democratic institutions are allowing uh, a, 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 a agreements, for instance, to be passed into laws that then become, that don't dilute them, or a negotiation process that doesn't allow the more powerful act of the state to undermine uh, the, uh, the ability of ethnic minority groups to, to uh, voice and negotiate on their, on their grievances, even when they're following rules that they themselves had created and established. These are important aspects that have been, I think, underemphasized in much of the debate on, on, on democracy. So we need more attention to this process, to process, to less visible dimensions of peace agreements, negotiation forms, and uh, as I started to, to, uh, to discuss a little bit, the post-legislative regulations and process. The boring bureaucratic regulatory process of the curves that no, none of the political actors on either side are interested in, it is actually remarkable the degree to which it's at that level that oftentimes the, uh, what was given by the state and given by legislation slowly gets eroded through regulatory processes afterward. And we see it happening in Indonesia, even in Aceh, <clears throat> where there have been some complaints that in fact the, the law of Aceh has started to look more and more like just the same autonomy that other provinces have obtained, but it's still held, a piece held in, in, in Aceh, uh, in other areas of the world, uh, of, of Southeast Asia. Uh, those have been some, some real sore points because they didn't gain as much as the Achenese did. So that's my uh, presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, spanned a lot of, intellectual territory, empirical territory, I was a fascinating, and, you know, paying attention to details that I frankly, for many people would just sort of pass over their heads, right? I, you know, the black box of government opened up in relation to ethnic war, extraordinary, just extraordinary. Yeah.
Scott, do you have any remarks to make? Yeah, I know no prepared remarks, but if I could just maybe comment on, on some of the presentation from, from Jacques, which was fascinating. Um, and, and having lived at different times in Philippines and Indonesia and Myanmar, I, I know just enough about these things to be dangerous. Um, <laughs> it strikes me on the winning by process when you focused uh, on, on Myanmar, as your book does, it, it's really interesting when, when I was there from 2016 to 2020, <clears throat> Um, there was, as you said, the process became stagnant. There had been some momentum under the Tain Sein government, uh, particularly in 2013-14. By 2015, when the nationwide ceasefire was signed, I think the momentum had already waned. But then it didn't get a new jolt forward under the NLD government um, for a variety of reasons. And what a constant complaint uh, during that period from 2016 to 2020 was that it was all about process or, and all about the sort of architecture of the peace process, which was mind numbing in its detail, as you know. And there was, sometimes it seemed more attention being paid to that process and to that architecture. Well, we need to have a meeting of this committee, which would then lead to a meeting of that committee. And it became more, who's going to show up? Are we gonna be able to get participants, the signatories of the ceasefire? to show up. And it seemed, at least from the outside, that there was actually less conversation about, well, what, what will a political dialogue lead to? What are we trying to achieve here? And so uh, to your point and to the title of your book, it was really incredibly about process. I, I don't have any reason to believe, and I know you've made this point, that this was a deliberate strategy by the state. And let's, let's, let's just overwhelm them with process and keep them in. What was interesting, of course, in Myanmar, it's really complicated compared to, say, Aceh, because you have so many different uh, ethnic armed groups that were in some state of conflict uh, over time with the central government. And so um, you had both at the time of the nationwide ceasefire and afterwards, you had um, some group, groups that were continuing to fight and others that had signed on. And among those who signed on, there was a constant sort of tug of war um, between those that were maybe a little bit more invested in the peace process and those who wanted it, but were a little bit less willing to accommodate. Um, and, and so you had, even within those among the groups fighting against the government or previously fighting against the government, you had um, lots of distinctions. As to whether democracy mattered there, I, I agree with you. I think it, it, uh, the opening of the country certainly help create better conditions for the start of the peace process. But I think what it showed to me was if you really want that peace process to work, you have to, you being politicians, political leaders, have to invest some capital in making the case to the public about why this is important. And I think that gets to the second part, uh, the second analytical point that you were making about autonomy. It strikes me, maybe I'm wrong on this, that in Myanmar, and I would say argue in the Philippines, although uh, I, I'd be happy to be corrected if this is wrong, um, I didn't see heavy investment by political leaders in the process, particularly to support the idea that particular regions should be granted autonomy. Uh, I remember from my time in the Philippines, you know, for a lot of people, certainly in Manila, Mindanao was a long way away. Most people had never been there. And so it was something that was an issue for other people. And I think that was often the case in Myanmar. If you're in Yangon or Mandalay, it's a problem for some other part of the country. And I, I wasn't in Indonesia during the Aceh peace process, but I'd be curious, you know, the extent to which the country, the, the public, was brought in or at least aware and supportive of the process. Because I think. If you have a dictatorship, you don't necessarily need that political support or that public support. But in a democracy, it might create the opening for a peace process, but it also then creates a responsibility for the leaders, political leaders, to sell it. And certainly in the Philippines, under uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, when you had um, at one point the, the effort to implement the process. And uh, it seems to me, from everything I've heard, that there wasn't much of an effort by President Arroyo and her team to build, to make the political argument 
uh, to the Congress or others why this was essential. And so you had pushback, particularly among Christian minorities in, in the region, and that ended up uh, winning a lot of sympathy and preventing the process um, from moving forward for another decade or more. Um, so I'm curious, Jacques, for your thoughts on you know, whether you agree with that notion of, of how much a democracy, A, has the ability potentially to start the process, but B, then has the extra burden of having to convince the public or, or at least opinion leaders about the importance of whatever deal has been struck. Greg, those are great comments. Um, and I, I want to start with the first set of comments that, that, you, that you gave on, on, on the Myanmar context. And, and, and you know, as a general answer, I would say, mm -hmm. I think the problem is that, and that's been the problem with this literature that has analyzed you know, the role of democracy in conflict is that democracy has, it comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, it's, it's very broad, but also these conflicts look very different from one place to the next. And, and, I, and we need to remember that in, in the case of Myanmar, Indonesia, and the Philippines, we are talking about relatively small groups in terms of percentage of population. So obviously in these contexts, the democratic process at the national level never works for them. Right. I mean, at best, they can hope to have maybe a couple of representatives from their region that even though they might have significant territory they're trying to control, uh, they're, they're, they're at a loss in terms of their ability to represent themselves uh, at the central government. Now, there are institutions that have been put into place uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in, in uh, well, particularly in, in and even in, in Myanmar that was attempting to give more representation to regions or to states. And in Myanmar, of course, there's a constitutionalization of ethnicity. That makes a big difference. So ethnicity and ethnic groups is the unit of representation. It, for the longest historical, uh, for, for the longest time in, in Indonesia, there's, it's a resistance to recognizing ethnicity. So that even a way in which autonomy has been recognized in the constitution in the case of Indonesia, never mentions Aceh or Papua. In the Philippines, interesting enough, uh, there was at least momentum at the time of the 1986 constitution in that there's, there's a, a constitutionalization of autonomy for Muslim Medina and for the Cordillera. So at, that, at least at that highly democratic moment in the Philippines where there was a large amount of consultation to draft this constitution, it's probably not a more democratic constitution that's ever been written in Southeast Asia with so much investment into it and recognition of these groups and the, and the role, role of autonomy. And yet it's interesting that it's in the Philippines that you see the most amount of roadblocks that come to finding legislation afterwards. So coming back to Myanmar first, what did, what did Myanmar have? A very constrained kind of constitutional setting in terms of, of being able to advance these causes. But I think you're right that uh, the public certainly was not generally sympathetic to the idea of of, of ethnic minority claims, because of course, Myanmar, uh, for most people, uh, is, for most Burmese, uh, they had lived decades of, of oppression under the military, um, military rule. So it became a common cause, in fact, how could they uh, get rid of the military, reduce their role in, in government, improve their livelihoods. And, and so very difficult uh, ability from the part of the, of the general population to find sympathy uh, because they were they had that shared suffering. In that sense, you know, I think uh, how it worked through the the, the the negotiation process. Obviously, to me, it, it was one of the important reasons why Aung San Suu Kyi was not particularly invested in the process. That in some way, she understood that her her politics were first. She would probably write at that level first to try to reduce the role of the military. Uh, and, and, and her electoral base was obviously the majority. Uh, so that made it very, very complex. In terms of the, 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 role, the, the stalled process in the negotiations themselves, you know, that, that's the irony really. I mean, more representation given to a variety of groups to voice, rules that have been crafted by the ethnic armed groups themselves and ethnic minority representatives to only learn that those can be manipulated. And that, that's disappointing, but obviously there's more to it. There, there were divisions internally that 
but getting to uh, to the to the Philippines and and and, and and in Indonesia, I think one of the, in terms of the constituency, it is a bit similar in, in, in the Philippines in that, yes, I think that the point I made at the end about Duterte, what made Duterte different is that he was from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And he had a particular, particular sway in Congress that allowed him to push this through in what was seen as record time in Philippines, uh, kind of timelines for legislation, which allowed it to not die before the end of his, uh, of his mandate. This is one achievement, right? This PPL. Uh, did Indonesia have this? <clears throat> Not quite. In the case of Aceh, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I think you know the majority uh, was really reluctant to compromise. Uh, what I, one one um, one area that I did not mention is East Timor. One has to remember that yeah. the whole uh, drama of East Timor leaving Indonesia and the violence that came with it uh, was of course a, a, a precursor to the mobilization that was occurring in Aceh and Papua at the time of democratization. And for the rest of Indonesia, uh, if the rest of the world thought it was a positive thing that East Timor had left Indonesia, for Indonesians, ha President Habibi had let in the, in East Timor go. So, you know, from that end, uh, there was a lot of resistance to giving in to secession. But there was something different in Aceh, uh, I think, at the time, not there's a tsunami is one aspect, but I think what Edwin ended up making a bit of a more of a difference is that there was a kind of the violence was resonated uh, or, or or affected the public more because it was on a grander scale. It was more difficult for the government to continue repressing without having to account for the increasing violence in that chain. Why he had paid politically for that? President Rahim. Well, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. <clears throat> Perhaps I could share one or two. Um, one of them makes a comparison between the Tensane administration and the NLD administration and argues that it's generally accepted that the latter, the NLD administration, was more democratic, uh, which would imply, I suppose, that they would have better success and a greater desire, perhaps, even to solve the problem of. Uh, uh, of ethnic opposition in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, but the question poses this possibility that actually the NLD could have done much better if it had worked more closely with the Myanmar Peace Center. Now that's a very specific question. I can't even really tell you exactly what the Myanmar Peace Center was, but I wonder if you wanted to comment. Well, maybe this is a representative of the Myanmar right, Peace Center. It could be. Uh, I'm not sure. Under Tain Sein, there was a lot of international uh, support for the peace process, and that led to the uh, to the creation of the, of the Myanmar Peace Center, and and lots of uh, technical support went through that mechanism. Uh, and in some ways, one can credit the role that uh, the people in the MPC played at the time uh, and supported internationally very, very generously in that they did have the opportunity to come up with a number of ideas, a number of, 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 of um, uh, say workshops, training. There was a lot of workshops and training for that decade, some of which was useful, some of which a little less, but I think the point is that there was there was a team of, of, of specialists who drew on, on international uh, resources to, to advise both the government and to a lesser extent uh, ethnic armed groups, but they had a, a kind of a credible uh, moment uh, in, in that administration where, where they were coming up with more elaborate brokering role and, and, uh, and technical support. Aung San Suu Kyi uh, and the NLD government decided to reduce the, those resources did not uh, you know, wanted to have more hands-on uh, control over over uh, over this because of some of the, I guess the the weaknesses of depending so much on international support and external uh, external experts and wanted to repatriate internally uh, those resources. Good intentions perhaps, but it 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 meant that the the institutional and technical support to the process itself became very weak. And at that point, 
there was therefore in the negotiation process, very little of opportunity for the ethnic armed groups to find, for instance, the kind of technical support they needed. Uh, not that they were getting tons from the MPC, but more. Uh, and then from the government side, I suppose they were lacking expertise as well at some level, or at least it was more piecemeal and ad hoc than it had been in that more open uh, institutional space. So bottom line, would it have helped? Well, I think the first, the first part is to understand whether you know, Aung San Suu Kyi and her government were actually vested in wanting uh, uh, this to be resolved. I have a feeling that you know, by comparison, there was not a whole lot of political uh, will. The political will really got sidetracked by trying to, um, to rein in the military, right? And there was a competitive posture with the military. And of course, in the peace process itself, the military played significant role in all of these committees. And it became pretty obvious that the military, those, those many of the committees where discussions were supposed to progress in certain directions, it was the military representatives who would just simply uh, try to stall them in many ways because the military didn't have an interest in making uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD win that uh, either. So there was a bit of, there's a lot of this complexity happening, but I think from the outset, I, you know, the NLD more democratic in many ways, less democratic uh, in terms of its internal process. It trusted uh, the NLD team, not necessarily other, uh, other groups. I would just very briefly second the point about the military and <clears throat> perhaps playing more of a spoiler role under the Aung San Suu Kyi government or next to the Aung San Suu Kyi government than it did under the Tain Singh government. But also, very frankly, and me and my friends may not like the fact that I'm going to say this, but there wasn't much willingness on the part of the NLD government to make any substantive movements toward on autonomy and, you know, to really addressing the fundamental grievances. It was all process talk, but nothing that really suggested serious willingness to move um, uh, to address those grievances. Now, when we look at all the principles, there was something like, I can't remember how many, I think at some point at 50 principles that they had agreed on. This was supposed to be the, the main substantive achievements of the political dialogue. None of them were really dealing with uh, anything substantive that had to do with federalism. Yeah. Budianto Ponto Virgil would like to congratulate you on an excellent presentation. So I'm glad to convey uh, his uh, impression. Uh, and he would like to know whether the level of education uh, among the people who are re resident, whether it's in Aceh or some other contested zone, right? Whether that really makes a difference as to whether or not uh, there can be a successful outcome. Is that a variable that should be factored into some model here? Level of education of the ethnic minority groups? Yes, in Aceh, for example, of the ethnic minority groups. I think that's what he means. Yeah residing in the area right. where the, the problem uh, exists and the violence is taking place? Yes and no. I'm, I'm going to be very diplomatic. Oh, very careful. No. Don't be diplomatic. <laughs> I'm going to be, be diplomatic. Analytic. I'm going to be analytical. <laughs> I mean, does education matter? Education matters all the time. I'm not going to be sitting here if I didn't think that education didn't matter, right? I think it's very important at, at, at so many levels that um, obviously, you know, in, in Myanmar, the education system uh, has been decimated, right? So it, from, in comparative terms, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which region we compare, uh, we're not looking at high levels of education. Those who were um, most invested after, during the peace process were the, the, the Burmese and, and ethnic minority uh, uh, representatives who had been fortunate enough to go abroad uh, when, uh, when they, the, the government closed down the universities. And they came back and, and were trying to contribute something to, to Myanmar after having uh, received education elsewhere. But that came with the baggage that they had been out, outside of Myanmar, not from uh, Myanmar, right? So in Myanmar, I would say, it, uh, it's it, the, the, the level playing field is pretty even, except of course, there are some groups that have uh, an educated elite that, uh, that has been able to articulate a little bit more and have taken some leadership role in these negotiations. But in, the, in and of themselves, they certainly did not have the, all the technical ability and knowledge necessary to, to compete, say, in a negotiation process with uh, 
what the government was able to tap into at any stage of this negotiation process with for dialogue. It didn't matter under the Tsing government or the NLD government. It was, it was sorely lacking. In terms of, um, of Aceh in, in Papua, a little bit similar, except that in the case of Aceh, there was more of an elite. There was a, 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 an Achenese elite that was certainly present in Jakarta. That is, by the way, was helpful in making more palatable to the majority the idea of, of giving more to Aceh in a way that Papuans did not benefit from having this educated elite or having an elite at all present in Jakarta. Uh, and, um, and so at that level, I would say, of level of influence, uh, level of, of, of ability to tap into one's own uh, mm -hmm. constituents for negotiations. Now the Achenese, uh, GUM, they did have a, they did have some educated Achenese helping them, but they also were able to tap into outside external expertise to help them in the negotiations in a way that pop went to flat for. Now, why am I saying it's a bit of a, I, I'm being a little bit careful here. It's because it's often the case as well uh, that the argument is made, and usually uh, from majority groups, <clears throat> that one simply cannot give autonomy to uh, regions where levels of education are too low. And that's a, there's a bit of a catch-22 in that. Right? It's the sense that, well, you can't give it to them because they need to develop before you uh, you mm -hmm. can give them autonomy. There's a kind of you know patronizing, <laughs> centralizing approach to this that has not been successful. It's been the argument used many times now, and it simply tends to fuel grievances and fuels the structural inequality that leads you know groups to not have to build up the level of education. I wonder if I could also ask you a question. We're running a little uh, late, but uh, we can afford to perhaps run over time just a little bit if you've got the time. Because uh, I would like to ask this question. Our conversation has been particularly rewarding because it has operated at, one might almost say, a kind of anthropological level in the sense that we have been talking about specifics of actors, countries, cases, and so forth, without perhaps falling into what may be the intellectual trap of the grand answer, you know, the grand answer. Because uh, in a sense, the title of, of your book, right, Winning by Process, right, uh, raises, I guess, a, a number of questions that we don't have time to get into, but I thought I would put them on the table just to see how you might respond. First of all, winning by process, I understand, having read the book, refers to a result that favors a, a, a government democratic, presumably insofar as there is process because an authoritarian regime might not have a process at all, right? In which something happens that defeats or at least severely limits or sidetracks the possibility of resolving the ethnic war, the, the ethnic conflict. One possibility here, of course, is co-optation. It's interesting that we haven't talked about co-optation as one of the strategies. But overall, I read winning by process to mean something different, I think, compared to what Scott was, when Scott spoke, um, he gave us the impression that, that you think, think that it's not that the government is manipulating the process so consciously in order to defeat you know, the, the autonomous, the would-be autonomous groups. Uh, th there's much more to this that is not necessarily even in control of the government, especially if it's a government like the NLD, which is internally divided, you know, in that temporary holder, placeholder. But the, the other argument would be, no, there is a, a proposition here that if I am a democratic leader, I can use the democratic process and manipulate it for my purpose, which is not to solve this problem, but perhaps keep it going enough so that my claim to be able to solve it will enable me to continue my power, right, within a democratic framework. There's also the very broad question of, is this a comparison between democracies and autocracies? And clearly it is not, right? Because your cases do not include the, you know, you, you don't have the kind of standard social science <laughs> chart, right, with, you know, X variable and Y variable, and here are the autocracies. And here are the democracies and here's the outcome and so forth, which is actually refreshing, it'd be extremely refreshing because that simply erases all of the rich detail that we have uh, been exposed to during this, uh, during this conversation. 
but it does remain to distinguish something like the following. There is an actor. The actor is the ruler, the state, if you will, okay? Then there is a setting, there is a situation that the ruler didn't invent. It's a historical situation, for example. The ruler confronts that situation in which there is this ethnic war and is, is, has to deal with it. You use the word handle, can handle, yes, not necessarily solve. But take, take the Myanmar case. 60 years of rebellion. I mean, is there any other country that has a more sustained period of, of insurrection? That suggests intransigence, intransigence right there. So rather than look at the process, which is the product of thinking and policy and so forth in a contemporary setting, my God, you know, it's, it's for, foreordained, right? The failure is, is already, you know, baked in by decades and decades. I mean, if these people were willing to maintain that kind of a level of activity over so many decades, how can we possibly expect the NLD or, or Tencent, any, any kind of temporary outfit to be able to solve anything uh, with, with that regard? How about the diversity, 135 ethnic groups? I mean, at one point, as you point out in the book, right, that is, is one of the things that the state sort of does the, the counting, there are 135. Well, if there are that many ethnic groups, then you would think that that invites the state to manipulate them, to divide and rule, right? And that's not because the state necessarily wants to control, but because it has the opportunity, if you will, uh, to do that, right? And, and do you agree with Scott? Because I was a little struck. Do you think that, in fact, this winning by process is not a conscious, uh, you know, a purpose of the state? that the state wants to win, that the state is acting insincerely. They claim to be you know, trying to arrange a solution. They don't want a solution, actually. Uh, they want to remain in power. So, so, so can you help me with the interpretation here a little bit? Right, well, I should have responded earlier. I did catch um, when you said that, you, know, you implied that it was a bit more accidental. I, I you know, I, I think we, you know, we agreed, the three of us, the three, three co-authors, we disagreed a little bit, I think, uh, but I fall on the side that, it, you know, it's, we, we, can't, we can't conclude that this was just all engineered because the nice thing about it, the more one opens up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The more one loses control. Mm -hmm. If we've seen anything in Myanmar right. is that the military mm -hmm. opened up thinking it could, it could control the process of even just its own democratic mm -hmm. opening. And the reason why, yeah. It closed down in February last year is because it didn't anticipate the kind of consequences. So there's some of that, and I agree that you know, in part of winning by process, there's kind of an accidental change that occurs with with the opening up. There were some some yeah. surprises. There were people saying, for instance, they never expected Tain Singh to go as far as he was going, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so suddenly, Tain Sein was bringing the was bringing change further than 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 he anticipated, and then people in MPC were seeing an opportunity to to make to mm -hmm. to to put in some mm -hmm. agree, some aspects of of, mm -hmm. of agreement in the in the political dialogue that again was making the state lose the process right, and they saw a moment if we put this in now. They won't be able to do anything about it, and it's sealed before the NLD's election. So there were conscious attempts on both sides, some of which were unintended consequences that end up with a process yeah, that yeah. went one small point, and then and then after that, well, it creates a, a situation where uh, you know the outcome becomes right. the state's winning. But but a lot of it was deliberate, and the point of the book is to say that there is when you trace in the implementation of the 2008 constitution, in the way the changes that were made along the way, in the, the ways in which the, the negotiations proceeded, the control of the committees, the, the ways in right. which the rules right. were thwarted. It's hard to not see there was a thread here to try to make this more and more in the vision that the Myanmar state wanted in yeah. terms of federalism, which I, had nothing to do with what the right. other groups wanted. But I think we can, we can reach <laughs> harmony here <laughs> in the following way. You know, after all, it's, you know, you use the, the term can, right? Can democracy handle, right? but you didn't say will, right? Okay. So that's very important. And I think Scott's point, uh, which I think is appropriate, can be interpreted in, in the following way, that 
the more democratic in the genuine sense, I mean, we could debate what's the definition of democracy, that we don't have time to do that, but in the genuine sense of democracy, the more democratic a regime is, then the less likely it is to have this manipulative kind of purposeful sort of, we're gonna use the process uh, in order to remain in power. Uh, and it's very handy to have an emergency out there because, hey, in times of emergency, right, you know, you gotta side with us, you know, we're, you know, the kind of, uh, the, the, the just of, well, anyway, I could go on. I think so. And if, if that's what Scott meant, and I think that may well be what he did mean, then the answer to your question, because we haven't actually answered it, right? <laughs> I mean, we haven't used yes or no. Can, you know, can democracy handle ethnic order? Well, yes or no, right? Sometimes it can. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes right. it can, but that raises the question, what are the criteria that should be in place in order to strengthen the yes answer, that yes, it can handle them, right? And I think that has to do, at least in part, with the character of democracy. Was the NLD, you know, how democratic was the NLD? In fact, can we even talk about the state at that time, since you had the Tatmadaw on the one hand, the NLD on the other, very, very different kind of entities, both of, of them involved in, in power. So the notion of a unitary actor becomes kind of questionable. And I think Scott's point is very well taken that, that you know, this can work if the democracy is a democracy, but if it's a democracy that is compromised in many respects and so forth, then yes, uh, you can win by process. I mean, you know, uh, look, I mean, I hate to say this, this is really exceeding my bounds uh, radically here, but uh, is, it, is it possible that uh, Donald Trump will win by process here in the United States because of the extraordinary elaborate democratic process that we have. Now, so, so in other words, the answer is not yes or no. It depends upon the character of the situation that exists, in addition, of course, to the actors. In this case, of course, the cat and the dog, the NLD, and so forth. No, I, I think, yes. I think that was his point. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I agree that there is, yes, in a context where you have more democracy, you're likely to have less ability to manipulate the outcome yes, of your right. Yes as to whether it produces necessarily a, a system or an outcome that is favorable to uh, resolve ethnic minority grievances, it is going to be quite uh, context dependent. Yes. But, you know, so how do we generalize this, right? right? Exactly. So what I'm trying to say here is that in, you know, there's a structural problem when you have small groups that, ter that control territory or are nationalists in, their yeah. in orientation yeah. and they don't have the kind of leverage in a, dem in, in a fuller democracy. If the Philippines taught us one thing, it's certainly that uh, when you have institutions that rightly reflect the power of a majority in, uh, in the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're never going to have a majority that is necessarily going to be sympathetic and supportive right, right, exactly. of the demands of these smaller groups. Right. It's going to take a lot. And some of this, going back to the long history, we're looking at histories in Myanmar of, of a lot of, the, of, of, you know, ignoring the plight of ethnic minorities, yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a very strong majority that does not have very any sympathies for ethnic minorities. Um, Indonesia is different in some ways, and that saved Aceh too in this kind of idea of an Indonesian nationalism, yes, but they're all a constellation of different groups that participated in the revolution in Indonesia right. that makes for an ethos of mm -hmm. the majority yeah, exactly. that is more inclusive in that way, right? Less in the case of Papua for different historical reasons, but you're, you're right. I mean, when we, you know, the step behind this yeah. is, yeah. of course, that they're the institutions and, and, and what they do represent yeah. uh, this long history yeah. and, and how they came about. Yeah, to me, I, I, the point I was trying to make on is that if it's a democracy, I mean, to your point, it's very, in some, it's very easy to imagine or, or to even point out examples of majorities saying, why are we going to give this minority group right. anything? Right, exactly, right. right. Exactly. And yes. so yes. You, you have to have, yes. right. I think, political leadership Right, that's invested enough and yes. serious yes. enough about, yes. in this case, granting autonomy or whatever right. it may be, exactly. and then making the case to the public, willing, right. you know, willing and able to make the case yeah. to the public that this is in the country's interest. Right. I don't think that happened in Myanmar. Yeah, I didn't see. Yeah. I, I think there was um, little effort, yeah. um, and uh, to, to sort of make the case to the country as a right. whole. Yeah. Um, and 
there was no pressure from the majority to make any to make any concessions to the ethnic minority communities yeah. and so you know there was a, the, the pressure on the nld and the military was really only from those ethnic communities which are important but a minority and that's why in our book we took we, we we've been you know we were asked to to think carefully before mm -hmm. we use mm -hmm. the state to, uh, <laughs> to put together the nld and the khatmada because of course we were talking for all this time about two states basically yeah. right but uh, but from the perspective of the long trajectory of how uh, the the majority in in uh, in myanmar has viewed these issues and 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 its, and its political position on this there's not a whole lot of difference between the Tatmadaw's position and the LNP. Yeah. Yeah. In that sense, yes, maybe there were different political interests right. in terms of making or not the certain committees and the political dialogue succeed or not, as I mentioned before. But certainly in terms of the outcome, I don't think there was a whole lot of uh, difference and, and the political investment mm -hmm. uh, was pretty similar. There's no, no strong uh, will to. So, to so the answer to the forward. question is, yes, uh, democracy uh, can handle uh, ethnic war if it's a genuine democracy. And as uh, Scott, I think, absolutely spot on, I couldn't agree more, ably led, well led, which is something that, you know, uh, fanatically libertarian Democrats don't like to hear because as soon as you talk about leadership, well, that sounds authoritarian, you know, the community and blah, blah, blah. But it's really essential. And I think that's a major lesson from your research. I really do. That the leadership matters tremendously. Scott's right. Leadership matters, uh, but leadership as well needs to be. I mean, it, it's always there are always political uh, yeah. gains to yeah. be made. If a mm -hmm. leader cannot see the political payoff, yeah. you're not yeah. going to get the yeah. benevolent leader. I mean, you can get the yeah. occasional benevolent yeah. leader who's yeah. a Democrat. It's uh, <laughs> no one would hope that they would emerge a little more often. We'll see in the uh, in the U.S. elections. Yeah. I won't go there. <laughs> well, <laughs> but. Um, uh, on but for the too. most part, you know, for the most part, you do need to have coalitions, right. Right. coalitions that work, and, right. and 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 it's hard to create those coalitions of, of good intent without yeah. the level yeah. of mobilization right. that I think minorities, unfortunately, sometimes yeah. have to continue. On. Well, on behalf of the audience, I want to thank you both for your comments. Very, very illuminating. Enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And to the audience, thank you for attending. Thank All you, right. everyone.